All right, well, welcome. Welcome to Igniting a Nation, and uh, I'm Rabbi Eric Walker, and uh, we are here every Tuesday at 7 o'clock. I mean, we're here every Thursday at 7 o'clock. We're at Berkeley Bob from Coleman for a short period of time until we outgrow that space. Uh, but we're in Coleman, so if you catch us in Coleman, you're going to hear some of the same information. Uh, Don and Sandra were there, and you'll hear some of the same things you heard, but we'll go further because this is the, the starting point for each segment of the teaching. Uh, we are in discussions to go to Tuscaloosa on Monday nights, and we're talking with the pastor and the, and the elders at uh, the church of Tuscaloosa in Northport. So if you have friends, start spreading the word uh, in the Tuscaloosa area of uh, people wanting to get involved and hear this kind of teaching. There's a visitor card up here. Uh, there's an offering envelope up here. All contributions are tax deductible. Uh, we don't solicit or take up an offering. If you feel led to support us, praise the Lord. If you feel led to come and listen, praise the Lord. It's, uh, we're supported 100% by gifts. And so it's up to you what you give. If you give, it's not out of a requirement or out of compulsion. It's out of love for what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, I do have an Israel trip coming up June 18th to 28th, 2015 that I'll be leading. And uh, there's still some spots available, so if God has put it on your heart to go to Israel, I can tell you that there's no better time to go than now. Nothing is different in Israel than it's been in 5,000 years. There's always been an enemy trying to kill us, okay? but they don't do a very good job in Israel. Uh, it seems they do a better job in France, they do a better job in Germany, they do a better job everywhere but Israel in killing Jewish people. Uh, they even do a better job. More Jews die in America than die in Israel. All right, by acts of terrorism. So it's the safest place in the world. A number of you are here who have been to Israel with me. It's an amazing trip. We uh, take you to places that you've never been before. Uh, I kind of tell people that if you wanted to call God from Birmingham, it's a long distance call, but from Israel, it's a local call. So it's very exciting. All right, let's open up in a word of prayer and dedicate this time to the Lord as we get into our teaching. And uh, although it's prophetic, it is the prophetic significance of the Feast of Israel. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, we thank you for this gathering. We thank you for the bodies and the minds and the hearts and the souls that you bring into this place to hear your truth. Not my truth, Father God, but your truth. That the teachings here are taken directly out of your word, Father God. And that our job is to make sense of it so that we can understand, so that we can have a deeper relationship with you. Father, you want to hear from us on a regular basis, and through the studying of your word, we come to faith. It says, the word says to study to show yourself approved. It does not say to study to show me approved. It says study to show yourself approved. So we give you a pattern and a teaching in which you should go deeper. You're equipped to go deeper. And we give you that gift to go deeper by imparting to you the word of the Lord and a deeper understanding from Genesis through Revelation. It's one book, it's one message. There are two people in that book and they're gathered here tonight, Jews and Gentiles gathered together, one in Messiah that binds us together in unity. So Father God, we ask that a spirit of unity, a spirit, a hungry spirit falls upon us, Father God, or we want to know more about you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share your word. Thank you for the hearts that are here tonight, Lord God. We dedicate this time to you as we pray in Jesus' name. So we've been talking about the prophetic significance of the Feast of Israel. And I'll give you a little fast review. I have to uh, grab a hold of my little trusty, dusty pointer here. And we've spent the last couple of weeks talking about the Spring Feast and the fulfillment of the Spring Feast, which was the four of them. That, that Passover was a time of the redemption of Israel, the setting free of bondage of Pharaoh. Jesus came on Passover, he was crucified on Passover to finish the job and deliver us from, from sin. So we were slaves to sin, we were slaves to Pharaoh first. The Passover, the first Passover, the first Exodus delivered us from that bondage. Jesus came in the spring to fulfill that. Uh, we celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread by taking, during that period of time, eating unleavened bread. And if you look at the unleavened bread, you take a look at uh, Isaiah 53 and the description of Jesus given by the prophet Isaiah who says that he was pierced, he was bruised, that by his stripes we were healed. Well, if you take a piece of matzah and you rub your hand over it, 
you can feel the bumps and bruises. When you look at it physically, you can see the stripes. When you hold it up to the light, you can see the piercings. And you know it's made without leaven, therefore it's representative of no sin. And so Jesus was that for us. And so during that period of time, he was buried. And so three days later after his burial came the resurrection It happened to come on the Feast of First Fruits. It's an important celebration. These are not accidental and coincidental events. These were defined by God as showing us the complete fulfillment of the prophetic nature of the feast. So Jesus came on the Passover as the Lamb of God. We know he was the Lamb of God because Yochanan, John the Immerser, John the Levite, not John the Baptist, John the Levite, his father was a Levitical priest working in the temple. You remember that's how it all came about, that, that he was struck uh, speechless because he challenged the angel of the Lord uh, about the fact that he was going to have a child. Uh, he imparted to him that you shall name the child John. He didn't speak again until it came time to name him John. And so, therefore, John was the first son, the only son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. His father ministered in the temple, therefore he was in the Levitical priesthood line. He was a Levitical, he was a Levite. So he wasn't a Baptist. Baptist didn't come along until much later. So we know that he rose, the resurrection took place three days later on the Feast of First Fruits. And this was the harvest. This was when you lifted up out of the ground the sheath and you raised it up to the Lord. And so Jesus was literally first fruit raised up from the ground on this feast day, an appointed time of the Lord in Leviticus 23. And then 50 days later, 50 days from the resurrection, okay, and it's an important date because the resurrection took place on a Sunday, 50 days later would be seven Sabbaths plus one day, which would make it also on a Sunday. Okay, seven Sabbaths, Saturday, 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 Saturday Sunday. Okay? That's when he said he, he sent the Holy Spirit, and we read in Acts chapter 1, mostly in the beginning of Acts chapter 2, this event. And we know that it parallels Pentecost. The first Pentecost was the day that the law was given to Moses. Uh, when Moses went up the mountain, if you remember, there were tongues of fire that came from the mountain. There was smoke. There was a loud trumpet blast when he came down from the mountain with the tablets of stone. He broke the tablets of stone because he encountered the golden calf. God instructed him to melt the golden calf, take the gold poured into the water, and make the people drink the water, which would make them sick because it was bitter. And then he told the Levites to kill the men who were involved in it, it wound up being a number of 3,000 died that day. Well, on the next Pentecost, the, we have the first Pentecost, which is 50 days after the Exodus, the next Pentecost that we refer to biblically of significant event is 50 days after the resurrection. Still the same day. Okay, 50 days after the resurrection, we count off seven Sabbaths, okay, plus one day, it becomes a Sunday. And what happened on that day? They were gathered in the city in Jerusalem because it was part of the appointed pilgrimage times. So there were three pilgrimages the Jews had to make. They were required to make each year. The first one was Passover. The second one was Pentecost, or Shavuot, Feast of Weeks. And the last one was the Feast of Tabernacles. So it made sense that the population of Israel would be swollen to a large number of Jewish people gathered in the city to celebrate and to bring their offering to the temple on this day. So we commemorate the first Pentecost, the first Shavuot, the first Feast of Weeks, as it's called in Leviticus 23, as the day that the nation of Israel was really born, the day that God imparted the Ten Commandments. But we know that there was a consequence for the rebellion. So what God prophesies and what God accomplishes in the Old Testament, he fulfills in the New. So when we look at this 50th day after the resurrection, we see a similar events to what took place on Mount Sinai. Tongues of fire, a loud trumpet blast, billowing smoke, uh, <clears throat> and the Spirit was given to them, and they began speaking in tongues. Peter comes down, he preaches the gospel to the masses, the throng of people there, and 3,000 are saved. So what was prophesied, 3,000 died, 3,000 saved. The same environment in the upper room as it was on 
Mount Sinai. One was the giving of the law, the other was the giving of the Spirit, as it was given to us in Jeremiah 31, where God says, Behold, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and it won't be like the old covenant written on tablets of stone. I will write it on their, on their hearts, and it will be in their minds, and no longer will a man have to tell his brother to know the Lord, because they will all know me from the greatest to from the least to the greatest. So it's important for us to understand the prophetic connection and links that if God says it, I actually put a posting out today, so somebody sent me a question, and I said, listen, God did not create recess. He does not play. So if he said it, he meant it. And we have to connect the dots of Scripture to see if he said he was going to make a new covenant. And it's important to understand the covenants, because the covenants are progressive. Okay, there's seven covenants. A lot of people talk about eight covenants. I, I combine the covenant with Adam and the uh, Edenic uh, Garden of Eden covenant as really one. But the first covenant was made with Adam in the Garden of Eden. You remember the covenant was if you, you can eat from the tree of life, but you cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you do this, you won't die, and I will provide for you a place, and I will be in fellowship with you, and all these good things will happen. That was the first covenant, but that was violated. The second covenant was made with who? Anybody know? Noah. Okay, so that covenant was the rainbow covenant. Call it the rainbow covenant. That never again would God kill mankind by flooding. He didn't say he wouldn't kill them by fire. He didn't say he wouldn't kill them by disease. He just said he wouldn't kill them by flooding. All right. Next covenant comes after Noah comes with Abraham. All right. And he calls Abraham out. And so this is the Abrahamic covenant. This is the covenant that when you become a believer, you actually become a co-inheritor of the promise of that covenant, which was a land covenant. So you become a citizen of the commonwealth of Israel, and you are a participant in that covenant that was once reserved to the direct bloodline to the seed of Abraham. But now you're grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel the same way I'm grafted in, even though I'm a natural born Jew, I'm grafted in by my faith. I'm grafted into the commonwealth of Israel, to the fig tree. Okay, so Gentiles are grafted into that tree, Jews are grafted into that tree, because we were cut off from our unbelief, and Gentiles had no place there. They were a wild branch. So after the covenant with Abraham came the covenant with David. And if you remember the covenant with David was, you will never fail to have a, uh, someone in your lineage sit on the throne of Israel. Okay? So after David came Israel. And Jeremiah 31 was establishing the covenant with Israel. What would that new covenant look like? So that was the sixth covenant. Am I correct in the numbers so far? Hmm? From there? Yeah, six? Israel's the fifth. Who did I forget? So I've got Adam, Noah, Abraham, David. Adam, Noah, Abraham, David, Israel. What, who am I missing? I'm missing somebody. Moses. Moses. The covenant with Moses. Thank you very much. The covenant with Moses. <laughs> Forget Moses all the time. So the covenant with Moses. Uh, before the covenant comes with, with uh, David and then the covenant with Israel. So that's six. And then you have the new covenant of John 3.16. Each covenant incorporated parts of the prior covenant. Meaning that John 3.16 went all the way back and fulfilled the covenant in the Garden of Eden. And it's important to understand this because God is a progressive. He builds upon what he says. He doesn't just say it and leave it. Usually it's confirmed three times in Scripture. You just have to see, seek out the connection. So what happened? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, the world, he didn't say the Jewish people, and he didn't say the nations, he said the world, that whoever would believe, he sent his only begotten son, that whomsoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. The only way you can have eternal life is to eat from the tree of life. The tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. Jesus gave us a clue to this when he said he was a sword. He came to be a sword. Okay, the Garden of Eden is protected by two, what? Right? With, with swords. So now if I'm grafted in, I'm accepted by Jesus, and I'm now able to eat from the tree of life, and I now have access to, through the sword, because I'm coming in back into the Garden of Eden, okay, through Jesus, the sword. I now have entrance into it. 
So this is a fulfillment of those seven covenants. So when we understand that God is a covenant-keeping God, Israel was not replaced by the church. That's called replacement theology. So if Israel wasn't replaced by the church, and God still has a covenant with Israel, uh, and he's a covenant-keeping God, some events have to come in the future which fulfill the covenant that he has with Israel. Israel has to come to faith in order for him to fulfill the covenant and the promise that he made to Israel. So when we look at these feast days, we understand that we have to put them in the context in which they were given to us, which is the context of the Bible, and that is Leviticus 23, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed feasts. He doesn't say that these are the Jewish holidays. He says they're his feasts, God's feasts. These are his appointed times, the appointed feast of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assembly. The Hebrew word is Moedim. So Jesus fulfilled prophetically, physically, in the natural, his entrance to Jerusalem on the day of the selection of the lambs. He was inspected for four days. He was nailed to the cross at the same time that the lambs were being tied to the altar. He took his last breath as the lamb was slaughtered. Blood and water were pouring out of the side of the temple because they slaughtered 250,000 lambs on that particular day. And there was so much blood that they had to take buckets of water. And if you looked at the side of the temple, blood and water were streaming out into the Kidron Valley. And blood and water were coming out of Jesus' side. So when he said to tear this temple down and rebuild it in three days, okay, he looked just like the temple. The temple was bleeding blood and water. He was bleeding blood and water. It was no longer allegorical, but it was very literal. And it came to pass that in three days he rose from the dead. Now, there are times in the Bible where something is literal, both literal and prophetic. It occurred then but it's such an outstanding representation, it's linked to a, another prophetic event. The prophetic event was the only time in the Bible that a nation came to faith. Anybody know when a nation, the only instance in the Bible when an entire nation came to faith? Do you remember when that was? No, Israel didn't come to faith as a nation. Nineveh. Nineveh is the only nation that ever came to faith. What was that tied to? That was tied to Jonah being in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So this was a sign given to us that if a nation, listen, can a nation be saved? Well, God doesn't do it the first time in the new covenant. He does it the first time in the old covenant. He does it the first time in the Tanakh the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, so that we can be then looking for the signs leading up to a nation being saved. It's just like a father sacrificing a son. If Jesus just came to this earth and claimed to be the Son of God, and everybody acknowledged him as the Son of God, and the father sacrificed him, you'd be scratching your head and saying, what kind of loving father would commit such an atrocity of sacrificing his son? Imagine what DHR would be doing here in Alabama, all right? if somebody sacrificed, or even made attempted, you know, well, let me tell you the story about what my dad did to me. He took me up a mountainside, he made me carry the wood, he strapped me to an altar, and he took a knife and he was just about to jab it in me, and he stopped. Would well, you think that they would take that child away from that father? Of course they would. So we read in Genesis the story of Abraham and Isaac. And it's the exact same story as the crucifixion. They were both miracle birth. They were both the only sons of their father. They both carried their wood for their offering up the hill. They both said they'd be back. They both, carried, uh, they both left two witnesses behind that didn't see what happened. The ram caught in the thicket was wearing a crown of thorns. All these things were prophetic to prepare us to see that same event and recognize it and understand that the sacrifice for the uh, Day of Atonement, which we'll read about, uh, that all the, the awful, they call it the awful, the guts and the, and the skin and the, the renderings had to be taken outside the camp and Jesus was crucified outside the camp. So we have to begin to see that these are connected. They're not random. That at some point in time, God had to show us the picture of what was and what is and what is to come. And this is the nature of prophecy. This is not prophecy where 
a uh, guy with a slick back black hair and a skinny tie comes on TV and tells you that uh, if you sow into this ministry, I can prophetically tell you that God is going to give you uh, a hundredfold return. If any of you have sent your money in, I would love to hear your story of your hundredfold return. I have not heard one yet, except by a paid actor. But God shows us, he gives us glimpses. You know, there's an old expression that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. I don't know if you've ever heard that expression. Okay? But that's exactly what it is. And for us to understand the very words of Matthew and why they were where they were and why they did what they did, and being able to sit at the feet of Jesus in the places that Jesus went, we have to understand. Jesus observed the Passover before he became the Passover. Jesus observed the Feast of Trumpets before he would be ushered back by a trumpet. Jesus participated in Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, so that he could reference a particular point in time that he was familiar with, the Jewish people were familiar with, that would be a milestone date that they could identify with, that they would recognize that the giving of the law paralleled the giving of the Spirit. And they would recognize that because, you remember, this was not a literate society. These were people who understood what it says in the New Testament. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. This was orally transferred from one person to the next. The father was responsible for the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 6, 5, and 9. Deuteronomy 6, 5, and 9 says, Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. And these words I command you today are to be on your hearts. And you are to teach them to your children. And you're to talk about them when you walk along the way, when you lie down and when you get up. And you're to bind them as a sign between your forehead and write them on your hands and bind them on the doorposts of your house. So it was the responsibility of the father to impart the story of Torah to his children. It's not a matter of us being Torah observant, it's a matter of us being Torah aware. Because everything we need to know about the New Testament was given to us in the five books of the Torah. Now that doesn't mean that Tom has, has brought me in here to convert this to a Jewish congregation and cut off a part of every pew and make this covenant, this, this, this uh, covenant with the... No, it's informational to begin to understand how connected the Bible is from beginning to end. And that you uh, don't get a book and start on page 225 and feel like you got the whole book. You start on page one and you read through the book so that the whole story is laid out for you. So, our question becomes, if Jesus came in the spring to fulfill the spring feast, would it not be logical that our expectation is he'll return to fulfill the fall feast? Make sense? There's three feasts. The Feast of Trumpets. It's called Yom Teruah. Yom, Y-O-M, is the Hebrew word for day. Teruah is not the Hebrew word for trumpet. Shofar is. Teruah is the sound the trumpet makes. It's a uh, onomatopoeia. It's a word that sounds like the sound, teruah. Okay, so when you hear teruah, you hear the sound of the shofar blast, the first blast is teruah. Okay, and it's got a sound to it. Uh, and I don't have my shofar with me to play the sound. I don't do them that well. Followed ten days later by the Day of Atonement, followed five days later by the Feast of Tabernacles. So we're looking at the fall feast, and the very first feast was Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, also known in the civil world, and we talked a little bit about this, that it's called Rosh Hashanah, the head of the new year. It's the head of the beginning of the civil new year. And it's just the same as companies have corporate new years, school years start at different times. Uh, there's so many different new years in so many different ways uh, that it became the civil new year for Israel. Leviticus 23, again, because everything is contained in Leviticus 23 about the Moedim, God's appointed times. These are appointments, and they're very specific as to telling us whether or not it's for just the Israelite, or for the sojourner, or the person that lives with the Israelite, who is called Gerim, G-E-R-I-M. 
Okay, the individual is called Ger, and the group of individuals that live with the Israelites are called Gerim. They're Gentiles that pitch their tents with the camp of Israel. Okay? This is what technically Messianic synagogues are all about, is the Gentiles and Jews who pitch their tent with the camp of Israel and worship in an authentic Jewish style, but yet maintain a faith in Jesus. So then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, speak to the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, that month happens to be called Tishri, on the first day of the month you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Now I want to share with you that in America, and in festivals all over the place, people blow the shofar like it's a, uh, a call to worship, a call to celebration. Some congregations open up their service with a trumpet blast, but in Israel, there is only one day of the year and only one time of the year that the shofar is blown. Period. That's it. There is an opening trumpet blast. There is another blast that has meaning. There's the teruah, the tekiah, the shevarim, which is a, uh, and I'll explain that to you. Uh, and then the fourth one, which is the last trumpet blast, which is called Takia Hagodalah. Now we remember that Jesus will come at the last trumpet blast. There is a specific trumpet blast in Israel, which is called the last trumpet blast. It's not a random thing that somebody's going to wake up one day and Louis Armstrong is going to pick up his trumpet and blow the trumpet, and that's going to be the last one. We'll never hear the trumpet again. Every year for 5,000 years, 4,500 years, to me, everything is 5,000 years in the Bible, but for 4,500 years, this occurrence has taken place in celebration of the Feast of Trumpets, that this order of shofar blast would take place, culminating with the last trumpet blast. It's a frame of reference in Judaism that most Jewish people who grew up in the synagogue would recognize the expression, the last trumpet blast. They know exactly when that occurs in the service in the celebration of this feast. So the Feast of Trumpets, which is referred to as, as Rosh Hashanah, you don't hear about Yom Teruah, you don't go to the card shop and get a Yom Teruah card. You get a Happy New Year card. Okay? That's how it's become now as the Jewish New Year. Uh, it would herald the beginning of a period known as the High Holy Days with the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, occurring 10 days later on the 10th day of the month. The 10 days from Rosh Hashanah to the Day of Atonement, both inclusive, are known as the Days of Awe, a time of national repentance for Israel. It was a time of penitence, prayer and fasting, and preparation for the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is the culminating event of when the king comes to dwell with his people. We celebrate it as the Feast of Booths, when we lived in temporary dwellings for 40 years in the desert, while God was right there in the center. Now remember that. Remember the tabernacle on the desert. Uh, they, they call it Moses' Mishkan is the Hebrew word for the tabernacle. Tabernacle was shaped, oh, almost exactly like this building. It was rectangular. Okay, this is not square, this is rectangular. And the 12 tribes were encamped around the tabernacle. And the tent of meeting was right in the center. And that's where the Holy of Holies was, right? And who was in the middle? It was a pillar of fire by day, a pillar of cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. Now, I want to challenge you the way I used to challenge my congregation and say, listen, two million people encamped around God, and God's right there in the center of them, and they're busy worrying about what they're going to wear and what they're going to eat. Is that my goat overeating with your herd? People getting into fights, property, or can't, you know, you pitched your tent on my property. Can you imagine being in the midst of God? All of us say, oh, well, we would, oh, we just want to be with Jesus. I want to be right there at his feet until you get an itch and you get a little crick in your neck sitting there looking up at him. Pretty soon you're uncomfortable and you're squirming and you got to make a potty break and, you know, listen, listen, God, can you hold up your teaching for me because uh, I got an itch and I got an appointment. Uh, I gotta, I'm in plan and in network and I can only see this guy and they just called and they have an opening. So I, I'm sorry, I gotta go because I got this, 
this problem. And so people start being people. They had him for 40 years right in the center of the camp. And they acted like you and I act. So we're in the presence of the Lord. How long can you all pray? Well, in Korea, they pray for 48, 72, 96, a week, two weeks at a time. That's their prayer time. That's their worship time. Here in America, it's, uh, okay, Tom, get them in at 10. All right, Ken, uh, you know the deal. Okay, it's 40 minutes of music, it's uh, 18 to 20 minutes of a message, then we have a benediction, and the last thing that happens, Tom goes to the back door and he shakes hands because people have, they got to beat Church of the Highlands people that are getting out and they're going to get to the restaurant before them. they got to get out in a certain time, otherwise what's going to happen is there's going to be no seat at the buffet, right? or the ball game that they want to see, and so this is the way attitude, but the presence of the Lord is here, but we're in a hurry to get away from it. Because, because it's not convenient. Okay. What else did they have to do for 40 years in the desert but worship the Lord? But they were people. They got involved in other things. So whenever I hear people say, oh, what I wouldn't give to sit at the feet of Jesus. Yeah, I know what you wouldn't give. You wouldn't give your attention. You wouldn't give your time. You wouldn't, you wouldn't give of yourself. All right? Uh, I can guarantee you, me, I have... Uh, attention deficit just like every other man, I'm starved for attention. Isn't that what it is? Isn't that what attention deficit disorder is? If men were starved for attention? I think that's what it is. But we get distracted. Oh, what was that sound? What was going on over there? Oh, what's happening over in Bob's tent? It looks like something. Oh, maybe they're having a barbecue over at Bob's tent. Let's go to Bob's tent. Let's go over there. So we don't really have the attitude of what we think worship should be like, but then again, we don't have a different attitude than they had. So let us not consider ourselves so holy and righteous when we're the same with them. They had God right there for 40 years in the midst of them. And they paid very little attention to him. So the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, begins with a shofar blast. The shofar blowing on Yom Teru is a, is a combination of various sounds. The tekiah, it sounded first to call man's heart to give attention and hear the following sound of the shofar message. There's a message there. Now in the battlefields, the shofar, the trumpet blast, was used to call people to, uh, to take your positions. The first blast would be, you know, uh, attention. All right. The second blast would be, all right, deploy this way, this group deploy this way, this group march forward. The third blast might be retreat. The fourth blast might be uh, flank right. The next blast might be flank left. They have an order of the calls in the battlefield, but we're not talking about the battlefield. We're talking about the battlefield which exists within each one of us, and that's matters of the heart. And over the course of time as believers, our hearts get hardened. We get offended. We get our feelings hurt. We get betrayed. We hold something against somebody, and when every time we see them, we want to walk to the other side of the road. Okay? I know that's never happened here and that's never happened to any of you and you've only read about it in books, but it really does happen in the real world and it happens in the body of Messiah. So, imagine if once a year, here at Mountain Chapel, there was a service where Tom would take a hammer and take a very valuable priceless vase and symbolically get up there and shatter that vase and tell you that when you hear the sound shattering, all those hard places in your heart would break. How many of you would give each year annually to buy a vase of significant value? Raise your hand. I would. I know I would. Right? Because symbolically, it would re represent that I don't have to carry these offenses for so long, and now symbolically, these things are going to be broken, and I can relate to that. I can hear the shattering. It's physical, it's not spiritual. Well, this holiday season, this holy day season, became a time that Jesus referred to very specifically. And he specifically said, when you bring your gift to the altar and thereby realize that someone has something against you, leave your gift and go be reconciled to your brother, then come and bring your gift and it will be received. If you were here when I defined what the cross 
is really like. The cross is horizontal and the cross is vertical. The vertical aspects of that have to do above the cross with our relationship with God and everything below the cross is our relationship with man. Jesus was our sin offering. He was not our guilt offering. Guilt has to do with me and you. Our entrance in the kingdom of heaven is secure and we're to take comfort in that. But our relationship with people stinks. We are easily offended, we are thin-skinned, we're rumor mongers, we're gossips, we're slanderers, we're half-truths, we're opinionated, we draw conclusions when we have no right to. Jesus told us in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, judge not lest you be judged. By the same measure you judge somebody else, you're going to be judged. It doesn't say not to judge them, we're supposed to be fruit inspectors. If the person's not bearing fruit, I don't want to have anything to do with them. Fruit inspection is different than judging. And when I start judging and I sound more righteous than that person, I can expect about a year later some event to come out of the left hand out of nowhere and all of a sudden I'm being crucified. So, well, how, why did that happen? I never did anything wrong. Well, about a year ago you sat in judgment of that person and his activities and you, you made some comments about him and now God says by the same measure you're going to be judged. So it means we need to do it like they do in construction, which is measure twice cut once. Make sure that we're lined up long before we do it. And Jesus talked about that. Was he talking about this period? Yes. This was a traditional period of reconciliation. If you remember, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that anyone who is a Messiah is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. You are being called into a ministry of reconciliation. That means every believer is in full-time ministry. And the name of your ministry is reconciliation. You are called to be an ambassador of God as if God himself were speaking through you. This is what being a believer is defined as in the Bible. It's not this nebulous terminology about, oh, I'm supposed to be this, I'm supposed to be that. But no, you're supposed to be a minister of reconciliation. You're supposed to be blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall know peace. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The Sermon on the Mount was actually a commentary on the book of Deuteronomy. But we don't see it in that context because we call it the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, and we go down this path and we don't understand that he was saying that you heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you. You heard it said that if anybody does this, has, has relations with a person that's not his wife, he commits adultery, but I tell you. And each time he said that, he was making a commentary on Deuteronomy so that it became practical. It was no longer the Ten Commandments on stone. It was something that you could measure yourself against each and every day. It was practical. It was how we were to apply it in our lives. Well, these feast days, as they observed them, there was a season, a period of time in which they observed and things that were supposed to be going on. So the sound, the first sound is Tekia. It's then followed by Cherua, which is the holiday's name, which would then give his order to break off and away from every attachment that estranges us from God and from our own purposes and present mode of life, which is displeasing to God and leave behind every worthless activity. Now the terua is a broken sound. It boop, 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 boop. It's not boop, 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 boop. It's staccato. It's to keep on breaking, okay? If I don't break that vase with the first hammer blow, what am I gonna stop? No, I'm gonna continue to tap on it, 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 until it breaks, okay? This is what he's calling us to do, okay? To move away from our own purposes and present mode of life, which is displeasing to God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of our righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. All have sinned, you know, none are without sin, no, not one. Jesus even said, why do you call me good? There's only one that's good. So we know that the things that we do are displeasing to God. Some things we're aware of and we continue to do them because we don't set aside time in order to address those things and specifically take action to stop doing them. So this period of time is a period of self-reflection. It was established by God as a time when we just to have a holy convocation, a holy gathering, a Sabbath rest, a time with the Lord and into his presence so we could examine our own hearts. Remember the passage of scripture, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Uh, who can know the heart? It's wicked above all else. 
Think about all those passages about the heart. Okay? He talked about scattering seed on the ground. Okay? Uh, the heart has to be prepared in order to receive. Right? That, that circumcision, physical circumcision, is not salvation. Circumcision of the heart is what God is looking for. And so the broken sound reminds us that we have a job of breaking to do as well, and it's the breaking of our evil inclination. I know that the lost tribe of the house of Israel, the Bessenes, actually come to this place uh, two times a year. You know about the Bessenes, right? Uh, they come on Easter so they can be seen by everybody, and then they come back on uh, the candlelight service so they can be seen again. Right? That's the lost tribe of the Bessenes. Well, this is the way it is in traditional Judaism today. Okay, these holidays, I call them the Bessenes. Okay, the lost tribe of the Bessenes come so they can be seen on the high holidays and they can get the best seat in the sanctuary. Well, Scripture talks about that. Okay? In the traditional synagogues in town and every city that I've ever lived in, and I've been a part of a synagogue in every city that I've lived in, that the big givers get the front seat. And everybody knows that they're the big givers. Okay? And over the ark, see, it would be kind of like saying, seeing above here, right over there, saying, this space available, your name here. Because in the synagogue over the ark will be a brass plaque that has the name of somebody. Pizitz or somebody that was in the town here in, in Birmingham, the Hesses or whoever, were the wealthy contributors. Okay? And the sign would be up there for everyone to see. So it's a great fundraiser, Tom. This space available, your name here. Okay? And we could have somebody come and carve it in there and scroll it in there. It would be lovely. Uh, we can give them a little doorknob for 500 we can give them the end of a pew. See, this is where the church misses out. In, in uh, synagogues, every seat has a brass plate. Somebody had to pay for the seat. See, it's a great fundraiser. Okay? We had a prayer wall and you could buy a leaf. That's how we did it. Because I didn't want to mark up the pews. I spent too, many time, too much time facing them. Then the shevarim, which is the next sound, speaks for the heart of man, initiating the call to, to repentance and godly sorrow of the heart. The shivarim is, it's almost like a wailing call. It, you can almost hear the crying of the heart. And then the tekiah, which then follows, calls one to a new standpoint, a new attitude of faithfully following God's way of life. It's to rally us to come to a new place in God. And the last of which, the last trumpet blast, is called tekiah gedulah. It's a prolonged, the, as much breath as you can have, you hold that note. And you hold it, and you hold it, and it's an unbroken sound typifying a final appeal to sincere repentance and atonement. Here's the prophetic fulfillment of that feast. And here it is in 1 Thessalonians. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. There is only one day, one time, in which the final trumpet blast, the last trumpet blast in Israel takes place. Now, I hate to break the news to you, but Jerusalem is the where all things must take place. It is the spiritual capital of the world. And there is no great synagogue in Jerusalem, but there are temples all over. And at the very same time in the service, they are making a uniform last trumpet blast within their congregations. Services start at a particular time. Sabbath starts on when the, when the uh, uh, moon and, the, and you, see, you can see the moon rise and two stars in the heavens. Okay? That is the specific time of sundown according to the biblical description of that time. So everyone knows that hour and that time, and that's when services start. That's when the Sabbath begins, okay? Where do we get that from? 
We get that from Genesis 1, which tells us the seven days of creation. It was evening, then it was morning. Evening began the day. Morning did not begin the day. Evening began the day. And we understand where Sunday worship came from because it came Saturday night, what we call Saturday night, which was actually Sunday. So Paul would go to the synagogues on Saturday morning, on the Sabbath, and remembering at that time they didn't have electricity, so what did you read the Torah by? You read it by candlelight and daylight. So the synagogue had many lights, remember, that had many windows in it so that natural light would come in. And they would read this from the Torah scroll, and he would go there with them and celebrate with the Jewish community in the synagogue, not the great temple, but in the local synagogue. Uh, synagogue, the Greek, ecclesia, it would be the building. Okay? And it would be, there were many of those buildings all throughout Israel. So I didn't have to make a trip to Jerusalem in order to celebrate this holiday in my local synagogue. I could do that in my local synagogue wherever I lived. If I lived up in the Galilee region, I could go to any number of synagogues in that area. And remember, the Levites had priests, so each one had their own priest. The priest did not just work in, in, uh, is in uh, Jerusalem. They were deployed out. And remember that there were priests, there were many stories, Samuel, the story of Samuel, there's stories of Elijah, there's stories, many stories about going to the local congregation, the local priest. So it's important for us to understand that this singular event that occurs almost simultaneously, imagine if there were 200, 300, 500 synagogues across Israel at this last trumpet blast occurring which was the ushering call for Messiah's return. What does it say in Ezekiel 43? The Lord will return when he breaks through the eastern skies of Jerusalem. Well, it's no coincidence it would come through the eastern sky. The eastern sky looks over the eastern gate. The eastern gate faces east. So if I'm standing there at the eastern gate looking, I'm seeing the Messiah come. Why the eastern gate? Because that's the gate which is prophesied in Ezekiel that says that the gate is forever closed. It's a door that, that no man can open. And the reason it's sealed until the return of the Messiah is because the king, the prince, has already dined there. Jesus celebrated his last supper within the walls of Jerusalem. He had already dined there. So when he returns, he'll return and that gate will open again because God ordained it and said so that it will only open on his return. So when you go to Israel and we stand on the Mount of Olives and we look out over the Eastern Gate, we see that first of all, the actual Eastern Gate is under many layers of civilization, but on the landscape outside of the Eastern Gate is a Muslim cemetery. And there's absolutely nobody in the world that's gonna go dig up that Muslim cemetery without causing a nuclear holocaust in the, the, the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, so nobody even walks there. Nobody even goes there. Nobody even thinks about how they're going to open it. They just accept the fact that it was bordered up. The Turks, the Ottoman Empire bordered it up, walled it up. The Muslims built a, a uh, cemetery there. And cemeteries are sacred ground, regardless of who's buried. When I go to a, to a Christian cemetery, it's sacred ground to me because from the dust of the earth we go, dust of the earth we return. We talk about the land of Israel, we talk about the land here, although we have these vaults. I still believe in my heart of hearts that somehow they could make it back into the earth. So the earth in a cemetery is the culmination of our loved ones. And it's a very spiritual thing. How do we know? Cain, where's, where's your brother? Well, why do you ask? Well, because his blood cries out from the ground. Interesting concept. Leviticus 11, 7, 11, 17, 11, uh, for the life of the thing is in the blood, and the blood for making atonement. So Jewish people are not embalmed because the life is in their blood. So that's why they're usually buried within 24 to 36 hours. You see uh, some young man died in Israel, he's buried the next day. You don't embalm. Okay, embalming is not part of Jewish tradition. Why? Because if you remove the blood, the blood, the lifeblood, they can't be resurrected. And each Jewish person is buried with his head facing east. Even if the headstone is at their feet, they're buried so that they're raised up facing east. All traditional Jewish burials are done that way. 
So it's important for us to understand because it's believed that those who are asleep in the ground who did not know Messiah would have an opportunity. Is it a second chance? I don't call it a second chance. Biblically, that's not supported. But why is there faith and belief that God would raise them up at the coming of the Messiah? It's been a teaching that's been in existence before Jesus. So where did it come from? Where did they get the understanding from? I can't answer that question. There were many great rabbis at the time, Rabbi Akiva. Uh, we know Rabbi Nicodemus. We know Rabbi Shaul, Paul, the, Paul of Tarsus. These are teachings that they gave at the time while the altar still existed in the Second Temple. So what about life before the Second Temple was destroyed? What about those parallel period of time where even though the curtain was rent in two, the priest still went behind the torn curtain and made sacrifice until 70 AD. So from 33, the age of 33 when Jesus died, for a period of 37 more years, the temple still stood. And people continued to come for the Passover, they continued to bring their offerings, and they continued to celebrate the Day of Atonement, which we will talk about next week because we've hit our time due to technical difficulties, our start time was delayed. So are you tracking with me so far on where we are? It's making sense to you that these are prophetic feasts and they're important prophecy because they line up with what was told to us in the teachings in the New Testament. In order for us to understand 1 Thessalonians, we have to understand Leviticus 23. We have to understand the observance and why these traditions exist and how these patterns of behavior came into being. Because when Jesus returns, he's gonna rule and reign for a thousand years from a temple in Jerusalem that's gonna operate just like the first temple did, and just like the second temple did. And he's gonna operate the third temple. And then we read that that third temple will be defiled, and therefore what happens? After the battle, there'll be a fourth temple, and then there will be no more temple. Because you won't need the temple, because you have the new heaven and the earth, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. So it's important for us to understand that it's going back to the same order it was before or during the time of Jesus and prophetically he fulfilled those first feasts, those spring feasts. So Israel has two harvests. They have a spring harvest and a winter harvest, a spring and a fall, depending on what you want to call it. And it's important to understand that because that's what supports the belief that if he came in the spring, he would again be harvested and he would return in the fall. It's what's believed as to why his father's name was Joseph. Not his biological father, but the man that God chose to raise him. Remember, and this will be interesting because uh, this is going to come up, uh, Tom and I are going to talk about the 13 disciples. Nobody wants to tell me there were just 12? The 13 disciples. Jesus was discipled by the Pharisees for 30 years. He was the first disciple. Remember, he lived in the temple life. He lived in the temple world. He was raised in a Pharisaical world. He was taught by Pharisees. He was discipled by Pharisees. That's why he could speak to what it was that the Pharisees talked because they were raising him up and training him as a Jewish boy. He was the first disciple. He was the teacher. In order to have been the teacher, he had to be a student for a season of his life. Thirteen disciples. The twelve we know by name, the one that we never think about as a disciple. What about his youth? What was he doing during his youth? Twelve years old, he was sitting in the temple at the feet of the rabbis, having a conversation with them as one who had knowledge. They were debating Torah. What were they doing? They were discipling him. They were teaching him. They were dialoguing. There is no learning if there is no argument. If everybody's in complete agreement, you haven't learned anything. It's when you argue with me and you take a position and take a point and we discuss that point and we come to a conclusion that you have learned something because it's moved you past your point of comfort. That's Jewish teaching. It's a Socratic method of argument. So when I say that there's 13 and you just nod your heads, okay, all of you have been taught there's 12 disciples, right? Yes. Okay. And so right now you hear something brand new and you're just going, well, if he said it, it must be true. Don't ever take my word for it. What? 
Was Paul considered a disciple? Was he with Jesus? Right, but he didn't spend he didn't spend three and a half years at his feet. Right. So thirteen. Jesus was the first. Yes, sir. Why? Because, well, what's the point of that? Is that when Jesus spoke with authority, he spoke for his Father. He said, I only, tell, I only say what I've heard my Father say. I only do what I saw my Father do. And when I talk about you heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you okay, that had he not been trained up in the straight line beliefs of the Pharisees, if he didn't understand what the Pharisees, the top of the Pharisees, where they believed in the Torah and in the prophecy, but also by the Sadducees that only believed in the five books and they were only law abiders. If he hadn't been exposed to the Essenes, which John was a part of, and been discipled a little bit with the Essenes, to recognize that when you go into Jerusalem, go to the man who was carrying water, because men don't carry water in Jerusalem, only women do, unless they're Essenes. He had to be completely conversant in all of that. And the traditions were not what his father had raised him for. The traditions of man, he had to be taught. He had to be in the temple to see it operate. Okay? The words that he imparted when he spoke on behalf of God and said, I only hear what I, say, what I heard my father say and only do what I hear my father do, established the fact that he was a son of God under the father's authority. But when we talk about learning, which is discipleship, right, how did he come to have the knowledge of what the Pharisees thought? How did he come to knowledge of what the Sadducees thought? How did he come to knowledge of what the teachers of the law really thought? How did he come to knowledge of what Rome really was, was, was doing in Israel? He had to get up close and personal and be trained. And when we read about the period of his years, well, even when we put together a harmony of the gospel, okay, we don't read a whole lot about there a period of time that we don't read a whole lot because that was his time of his training. And so in order to disciple in the pattern we have today, Tom went to seminary in order to get trained so he could train. Jesus, in his own way, went to seminary so he could get trained, so that he could train, but train the way the Father wanted him trained, not the way man, not the traditions of man. So the only way that I can speak with authority about the traditions of man is to have observed them myself for 44 years. I can give you first-hand practical experience about what it's like to live as an Orthodox Jewish person, as a conservative Jewish person, and as a Reformed Jewish person, raised up in a Hillel environment where I can tell you about the rabbis of old and what they taught and why I don't agree with them. Because okay, I had to be discipled before I could teach. Absolutely. It's to, it's, to, it's to shock you. It's to provoke you to want to know more. It's to say, I want to come back and hear the answer to that question. Hey, if I get a letter in the mail and I get invited to a class and it's about the, about the disciples, hey, I might want to come to that teaching because he just rocked my theology when he said 13. All right. We're talking about a fishing line and, a, and a, all right, and I, and, and I got you to bite. <laughs> Nancy. I was going to ask that. I just thought, you know, more people, more people, young men, more. Yeah, because if, right, if I tell you things you never heard before, you're going to say, I want to hear the rest of that story. Like last week, Tom heard something never heard before. He came back tonight for the sole purpose of having me answer that question for him. All right? Because I spent 35 years in corporate marketing, and this is how we did it. <laughs> we left you wanting more and wanted you to have the answer. So. Yes, I still do operate in the flesh, although I'm a spirit-filled man, and this is the way I build classes and build congregations, and this is how you do it as a marketeer. So thank you for asking the question. All right? Okay, we've hit our time. We're a little past. I'm sorry to keep you late, but I thank you so much. Let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, DVDs from all the last classes are available. In that black box there are teachings that I've done over the years, if you're interested in in studying worship, studying faith, studying the prophets, all those teachings are available. Uh, for whatever it is that you want to give, there's a couple copies of my book, which is a great Bible study on its own that are available. There's offering envelopes for gift, uh, visitor cards for you to fill out with email addresses if we ever get around to getting an email list. So let's go ahead and close a word of prayer. Pastor Tom, would you close us in a word of prayer tonight?
Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.